My presentation today is uh, entitled Current Economic Indicators and Commercial Real Estate Demand. So we're going to talk about big picture macroeconomic things and how it connects to our business, how it connects to commercial real estate demand. And I want to make sure to point out this is an interactive presentation. So it's not, not just me talking, it's us sharing. So I want to get your ideas and answer your questions as we go. So please feel free to, uh, to ask as I go forward. All right, so here's some conclusions we're going to reach this morning. My number one conclusion is the economy is currently healthy and continues to expand. Interest rates are low, historically low, and based on my research, I'm not an economist. I'm a real estate investor, which means your opinion is as good as my opinion. But based on what I see, I don't see interest rates shooting upward in the near term. Now, you may disagree with that, but I'll, I'll get into why I believe that. Capital for business expansion is increasing, which is a good thing for our business. Corporate profits are at record high levels. I'll show you some data on that. What that means is, generally, as corporations are profitable, they start to hire. There's been a lag in our hiring for a couple of reasons. Um, I think the primary reason is uncertainty about things. The business leaders who make the hiring and firing decisions are a bit uncertain about the future. So we'll talk about some of these uncertainties and why that's tending to lag uh, job growth in the U.S. So first of all, and some of you have, who've seen my presentation before, I take a very complex thing called the economy and I connect the dots. And here's how I do it. First of all, uh, I'm going to show you some various in, uh, um, symbols. The green box is what I'm going to call a leading indicator. It's, what, it's, a, it's a signpost of what's going to happen. A blue box is a coincident indicator. That's economists speak for what's happening right now in the economy. An orange box is a lagging indicator, and as you'll see, what drives commercial real estate demand generally lags the overall economy. And then finally, a red oval is actual commercial real estate demand. So here's how they connect. I start with consumer confidence. That's my number one leading indicator. If I had to pick one indicator to tell me what's going to happen with the economy, it would be consumer confidence. This is how consumers feel about their future, their jobs, their house prices, uh, their earnings, et cetera. And that's measured monthly, and I'll show you some statistics on that. Consumer confidence is so important because it directly correlates to consumer spending, consumer expenditures. And that's important because in the United States, consumer spending is uh, over two-thirds of our total economic output. In fact, it's 71%. So consumers buying and selling products uh, drive the majority of the U.S. economy. And and it's not only the U.S., it's pretty much the global economy now. It's driven largely by consumer spending. Uh, it's also important to have an understanding of interest rates, the cost of capital, and of course the availability of capital. And I measure that by what the Fed's monetary policy, the Federal Reserve, uh, the central bankers, what is their policy on the economy? And we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, the Fed is in a balancing act. They, they want to stimulate economic activity, but not so much that inflation becomes a problem, which is another indicator that I focus on, which is inflation. And I'm going to measure that as Consumer Price Index, or CPI is the abbreviation. And that's tied to a concept called velocity of money. It's how fast money in the economy circulates. And you'll see there's a correlation between velocity of capital and interest rates and inflation. So we're going to tie all these things together. Now, continuing, what, is, what does the economy drive? Well, it has a direct correlation on corporate profits, as you'll see. Now, not all corporations are 100% correlated to, to the economy, but most are. So it's the, the theory of a rising tide lifts all boats. So if the economy is doing well, it's going to have a positive impact on corporate profits. And that coupled with business confidence, so think of business leaders making hiring and firing decisions their, their, their confidence tends to rise if they're profitable and have prospects for continued profits. These two things combined tie to our first lagging indicator, which is employment growth. So think of employment growth as all the jobs in the United States, new jobs created, new jobs lost, which have a direct correlation to both corporate profits and business confidence. All right, so continuing, employment growth drives real estate demand. Now I'm going to start with office demand. That's my division, office using employment. So the big sectors of office using employment that we measure are professional and business services. So think of, and that's been the big growth, by the way. 
Think of attorneys, accountants, architects, engineers, that sort of thing, all right? It also drives or is driven by financial services, most of us in this room, banking, real estate, and it also a big component of office demand is information technology. Those are the big three, all right? So we measure those in our business as we look at different economies. Employment growth also drives a certain portion of industrial demand. So think of uh, research, technology, manufacturing type of jobs. All right, these are fall mostly into the industrial demand category. Employment growth also drives an, uh, another type of sector, which is hotel demand, and this is primarily business-related travel. You see there's a pretty high degree of correlation between business travel and the economy. And hotel demand is the most volatile of all because you lease a hotel for one night, right? So uh, our company invests for pretty uh, large in hotels. That's one of our key sectors as well. Employment growth drives people. So the, the connection here is people that are working age. So let's call them 25 to retirement, say 65. Why do we live where we live? Why do you live where, in Dallas, Texas? Well, we live here primarily because we have jobs here. So if economy is creating jobs, it's going to create people. Not only the working people, but non-working spouses, children, and retirees who linger. All right. And what do people tie to? Well, people tie to another type of demand. This is primarily going to be of industrial demand. This is primarily going to be your warehouse and distribution space. Warehouse and distri distribution is positioned near major population centers. All right. So if we can track population growth, we can track future demand for another type of industrial. Also, obviously, people drive housing demand. People form households. It's the basic unit of demand, and households growth drives housing demand of all sorts, and we're also fairly uh, heavily invested in multifamily. That's an important sector for our company. So we track household formations and housing demand fairly closely. Population growth has a direct correlation to disposable income. So what's disposable income? Well, that's income you have after you've paid your taxes and you've set aside some for savings. What's left over we call disposable. And that drives, as you can guess, another type of demand for hotel. And that's going to be primarily your resort and vacation hotel demand. But mostly it drives retail demand. And retail is another important sector to our company. We are invested fairly heavily in the retail sector as well. All right. These all tie together back to consumer confidence. Because if you have more disposable income in your pocket, you're going to be more confident about the future. So it's all cyclical. All right, so I'm going to stop right here. This is my simple-minded approach to take the complex animal called an economy and put it on one slide. What do you think? Does it work for you? All right. So what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to drill down to each of, these, each of these factors, and I'm going to show you what the indicators are telling me. We'll see if you guys agree. All right, so first of all, as I said, the number one is consumer confidence. Well, every month, the University of Michigan publishes a survey. They, they, they call households across the U.S. and they ask a series of questions, and it's tied to an index. And uh, I'm going to show you a series of slides. And by the way, these are easy to create. If you go to FRED, it's called Federal Reserve Economic Data. If you just Google FRED, you can create these slides for yourself and do this, this type of analysis. So I've got FRED going all the way back to the late 70s. The shaded areas are recession time periods, all right? And it's an index in this case. So you can see it moves up and down, and, and it's, it's fairly customary to see consumer confidence uh, decline rapidly early in a recession. And you can see that's indeed what happened during the, what I call the Great Recession, and it normally starts to pick up after a, a recovery kicks in. You can see trends there. Now, um, <clears throat> I, tell the, I tell my participants, I, I teach real estate classes as well, and I tell them, watch the man and not the dog. So what do I mean by that? Well, see how the, the line kind of moves around like it's an earthquake, like, a, like it's a seismic? Well, the man is generally moving upward, although the dog is all over the place. So anybody has a dog and you take him for a walk, you know your dog doesn't go in a straight line. He goes over to the fire hydrant, into the tree, and he sees another dog, and he's moving like this, right? Well, the man's generally moving in a certain direction. So when I take Cookie for a walk, I turn the corner, I'm taking her down this road, and I'm generally going this direction, although she's all over the place. So do you see trends here? We're moving up. My takeaway here is if you compare con current consumer confidence to where we were previously, do you see a difference? Definitely lower than previous recovery periods. And I attribute part of our slower recovery to the fact that consumers don't feel as good about 
things, including house pricing bubble, which I'm going to talk about, the, the, the recent economic crisis is fresh on everybody's mind, a lot of job loss, I'm going to show you that. So people are still a bit uneasy in this country. All right, here it is. This is the unemployment. Now this, the official U.S. unemployment rate is 6.3%. That's the official unemployment rate. But if you take into account the uh, employed for part-time or marginally employed, meaning people that would like to have better jobs or more stable jobs, the actual employment, unemployment is closer to 12%. So this is marginally attached workers plus uh, employed part-time for economic reasons. Here's the takeaway for me. During the, during the Great Recession, which is really December of 2007 till early 2010, U.S. lost 8.7 million jobs. That's a 6.3% decline in our employment. This was the worst employment recession we had since the Great Depression. It was a really, really bad recession for jobs. And this kind of puts it into perspective. It really shot up. We're getting healthy. The man's moving down now. It's, it's moving in the right direction. But that's one of the reasons we still have a lot of uh, uncertainty. All right, another reason for the, uh, the uh, consumer confidence not being higher is house prices. Now this is real house prices, meaning it's, meaning it's adjusted for inflation. So do you, do you see a bubble here? Well, if you draw a trend line, it's easy to spot. So beginning in about 2002, uh, you know, normal uh, inflation adjusted house prices are trending upward somewhere along this line, but then we started shooting up exponentially and we peaked in 2007, and in hindsight, it's easy to see there was a huge bubble being created, and you cannot continue to have house prices uh, climbing like Mount Everest. You just can't do it. And the bubble burst, and we know the after effects. In fact, it almost created a, a worldwide depression. It affected all economies globally, because the U.S., just keep in perspective, the U.S. is 25%, 26% of the world's global economy. So if the U.S. catches a cold, everybody else gets pneumonia. Well, that's exactly what happened here. House prices collapsed. My takeaway here is house prices are back to normal trend that we would have been without all this disruption. And they're 25% below the peak, but I think that's an artificial peak. It wasn't real, as we probably experienced. So that's kind of where we are right now. But here again, that's another reason for consumer confidence, I don't think, being higher. All right, here's, a, here's an interesting trend. This is uh, this shows new home sales and existing home sales. So existing home sales are blue, new home sales are red, and notice that up until about 2007 or 8, they're fairly highly correlated. They moved in tandem, and then what happened? Well, existing home sales started to recover much sooner than new home sales, which continued to de decline. Now, new home sales are finally picking up, but the gap remains. And I, I think over time, this gap should close. We hope it will, because New home sales are very important to the U.S. economy. I'm talking about new construction, now, new home sales. New home sales create a little more than three total jobs, new jobs in the U.S. for every one home. Uh, I mean, we, we had an oversupply of homes, right? <laughs> and so now we've got a shortage of new homes and, and we're catching up fairly rapidly. I expect this, this to continue to move upward, but that's another important thing to keep an eye on is new home sales in the U.S. because it is so important to our economy, not just financing the homes or building the homes, but furnishing the homes, et cetera. So they all contribute positively to the U.S. economy. This is real personal consumer expenditures, once again, adjusted for inflation. And this shows, this is zero. You can see uh, consumer spending actually declined. As we know, if it grows, if, if consumer spending is over three quarters of our economy and consumer spending is, is negative, you can imagine the impact it has on the economy. So we, we had a, a, a very bad recession. The good news is consumer spending is now growing at an annual rate of about two and a half percent. One thing you gotta love about American consumers is we can't stop spending very long, right? We gotta, we gotta buy the newest gadget, right? The newest iPhone, the newest car, the newest whatever. And indeed, that's what we're doing right now. That's a positive, I, I see this as a positive indicator for our economy. We want consumers buying things, all right? I'm, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of boring detail about the Federal Reserve, but I think it's important to get a few takeaways here. So they have obviously an, a significant impact on our economy. And as I mentioned earlier, their goal is to provide stimulus, but not so much that, that inflation becomes a problem. So it's a balancing act. So the, Fed, the Federal Open Market Committee last met on October 29th. Now it's boring to read these, these, uh, these press releases, but there's some, there's some good stuff in here and I've underlined it. The Fed has stated to us publicly that they intend to maintain 
a, a federal funds rate target, and I'll talk about federal funds in a moment, but they expect to, to keep federal funds rates between zero and one quarter of 1% for their foreseeable future, especially if inflation is below their, their target range, which is 2%. All right, so they're, they're basically saying, guys, I'm gonna keep the pedal on the metal. I'm, I am stopping my buying, buying program. I'm, I'm, I'm not putting more, more liquidity in the market. I'm gonna start tapering off, but don't expect inflation or uh, interest rates to go high in the near term. That's what they're telling us, all right? They're telling us, is, they're basically um, telegraphing what they're gonna do, all right? So here's, here's inflation, here's CPI. This is core inflation. And currently core inflation is about 1.7%. And I've, the dotted line is the Fed's target of two. Now, two to two and a half percent is normal inflation. So you can see we're trending below that. In fact, there was a time coming out of the recession where deflation, I don't know if you remember that several years ago, deflation was a concern. Deflation is not good. So you need about two, two and a half percent historically. Um, and this goes back to 2000. So you can see uh, comparatively, we're pretty low right now, and I, I attribute a lot of this to very low energy costs. Energy costs have, have really collapsed. All right, so what causes inflation? Uh, inflation happens when two things happen, or two things merge. One is your monetary base. Think of monetary base as how much uh, money is in the economy, how much liquid capital is in the, in the economy. When you get too much money in the economy, you, that tends to be inflationary. But it's only inflationary if that money circulates rapidly. It's called velocity of capital, all right? So you have, you have too much money that's moving too quickly, that's when you get inflation. Well, uh, velocity tends to slow down early in a recovery period like we are right now, because if you think about it, consumers, they tend, they're fearful, right? They're not greedy, they're fearful. So what do they do? They stop their spending, they, they pay down their credit card debt, they increase their savings rates, that has a, a negative impact on velocity of money circulating, okay? So here's the two factors. Here's your monetary base, all right? So it's cur currency and circulation plus bank deposits. Think of liquid capital. Well, midway through the recession, Bernanke, who was the Fed chairman at the time, he saw a crisis brewing. The good news is Bernanke was a, uh, a student of history. He knew what caused the Great Depression almost better than any central banker and I think we were lucky to have him at the time. He, he, he studied what we, President Hoover was the, to, the president at the time of the Great Depression. It was referred to as the Hoover Maneuver. So what did the Hoover administration do and the Federal Reserve do at the time of, of the, the stock market crash in 29 in the early 30s? They had a bad recession, but what the Fed did is they shut off capital. They starved the market for capital thinking that, right, that was the right move. And obviously it was the wrong move. It caused a huge depression globally. Uh, uh, which is the worst we've ever had in this country. Bernanke knew that was a problem. What does he do? He does exactly the opposite. He floods the market with capital. And you can see it's almost vertical, right? And uh, so spending federal deficit grew, if you remember, um, the, 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 the quantitative easing, you know, the, the bond buying program. The Fed's starting to slow that down now. They recognize this is inflationary. So you'll see over time, I, I hope, I think, monetary base start to decline again. We don't want it to continue to go up to this rate because that is inflationary, all right? But here's why we're not having inflation. This is velocity of money. Now, the velocity of money, once again, think of the number of times a dollar circulates in the economy, all right, and how fast that circulates. So that velocity currently is declining. Now you can see coming out in the last, the dot-com recession, velocity declined and then it started to pick back up again. The velocity has continued to decline. I anticipate in the next year or two, that to bottom out and to start to increase again. All right, so if you've got too much money and too much velocity, you will have inflation. I just don't anticipate it's gonna be a shock. I don't know, what do you guys think? Is anybody anticipating huge inflation? I know a lot of economists did coming out of this recession. We just haven't seen it yet. And this is, this is why I think we haven't. All right, so here's the federal funds rate. Federal funds rate is the interest rate that banks loan each other excess funds overnight and the Fed sets this rate. Okay, and this, by the way, ties to all interest rates. So the Fed can adjust the needle by changing the federal funds rate. If they move it up, it, has, uh, it, it raises all interest rates of all sorts. Well, right now, it's, it's been unprecedented. In our careers, we've, in our lives, we have never seen interest rates be this low for this long. All right, I don't expect this to increase anytime soon, but if inflation, I'm gonna say, remains around two, two and a half percent or below, 
I think the Fed's going to continue. They've told us they're going to continue to keep this rate very low. I do anticipate increasing interest rates, but I don't, unless there's a shock that I can't forecast, I don't think it's going to be a major problem. Once again, that's just my opinion. Commercial lending, this is commercial loans, uh, all, all commercial banks in the United States. And you can see about midway in the recession, they shut it off and commercial lending went down. Now that's bad for our economy. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, you need capital to expand your business, right? To buy inventory, whatever. And at the same time that, that the Fed's flooding the money, flooding the, uh, the, the markets with money, the banks aren't turning around and lending it, right? That was a problem in 2010, 2011. That is reverse course. And now commercial lending is an all-time high in terms of total dollar volume. These are billions of dollars on the left-hand side. This is good for our economy, right? The, the fact that you got a lot of money and it's being put out to work, all right? So that, uh, I agree with what you've said, but I think it has reversed course, at least based on, on what I'm seeing, which is good news. Here's our economy, here's GDP. GDP, uh, gross domestic product, which is a measure of output of all goods and services in the United States, is growing at an annual rate of 3.5% as of the third quarter, which is the most recent data. And that has been led by increase in exports, uh, private inventory investment, and personal consumer expenditures, which we looked at earlier. And you can see these are uh, changed from the prior year, but you can see it's growing, uh, it's positive. Uh, big recession here, uh, and we're back on trend for economic growth, although it's been slow, but we are definitely growing again. These are corporate profits, I mentioned those. So corporate profits is really interesting. During the recession, corporate profits took a nosedive like you would expect, but then look what happened. Midway through the recession, the worst of the recession was about September 09. The world was coming to the end, if you remember, mid third quarter 09. But look at what happened to corporate profits. They, they took an about face. Now, what do you think caused that? Why, why in the worst of the recession would corporate profits shoot up? Exactly. They laid off people, right? That's your biggest cost of most corporations is people cost. And if you're laying off people, you're cutting your cost, right? So you can't continue to cut forever. If you're cutting fat or whatever, you can do that for a while, but you, then you get into muscle, right? Well, they started... So I attribute part of this rebound to cost cutting, but you can't continue to cut, cut cost and increase profits. So I, you know, starting really in about 2010, 2011, uh, we're having top line revenue growth across the board. And if you invest in the stock market, you've seen that. You've been the beneficiary of that. Corporate profits are at record high levels today. I, I try to not make this presentation political. I have opinions and I'm, I'm not that happy with the job our government leaders, no matter if you're Republican, Democrat or independent, I don't think they've done us well. They've created a lot of uncertainty, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. That's the main reason I think I'm not, I don't think they've done a good job. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into it right now. This is small business optimism. So most people in the US work for small corporations. These are corporations of 20 or less people. So I like to track small business optimism, and very similar to consumer confidence, you can see it plummeted. And it's starting to rebound now, so dog has turned, or the man has turned the corner, the dog is moving around, all right? But, but comparatively, we're well below where we were previously. I think the reason is there's too much uncertainty. If you're a business leader and you don't know what tax reform is going to be like, you don't know what banking reform is going to be like, you don't know what Obamacare is going to do to you, and all these other uncertainties and dysfunctional government, what do you do? If you don't know what the rules are, you don't play in the game, right? So you don't hire. You, you kind of you stand pat. And that, I think that's what's been going on. And I think, I think our government leaders haven't done a good service for our economy by creating this dysfunction, right? So but you can go back any time in history and argue about government dysfunction. It's not nothing new. All right, so anyway, the good news is business optimism is increasing. This is monthly change in payroll jobs. Most recent data is as of October. US grew 214,000 jobs. Food service, retail, healthcare led that sector or the sectors that led the growth. This is unemployment by state. Now this is an interesting slide because it shows you the worst of the recession was blue, current is red, so it's all 50 states, and across the board you can see the recovery's been widespread. Every state has had a recovery. Now Texas is right there, right? Texas wasn't as hard hit and we're, you know, in the top one third uh, in terms of unemployment rate. But if you look at specific employment, this is Texas employment. This shows you uh, U.S., Texas, state of Texas, and job changes over time going back for the last decade, and then a two-year forecast. Uh, that's Moody's Analytics that we use. And so basically, you can see the recession, the blue, 
is the U.S. and red is Texas. Red outperforms the U.S., but it pretty much mirrors what's going on in Texas. Takeaway for, for me is, from the worst of the recession in 2009, Texas has created more jobs than any other state in the nation, by far. We've created 1.2 million new jobs. So this is a good place to be. If you want to drill down even further to Dallas-Fort Worth, Dallas-Fort Worth, very much similar to Texas. Dallas-Fort Worth, since September of 2009, has created 378,000 new jobs. This has been a job engine, and that's accelerating, by the way. We, we read the papers. There's more and more jobs being created in Dallas-Fort Worth than almost any other metropolitan area. This is a great town to be in, right? And as we've seen, if you, if you buy into my earlier connect the dots, job growth creates demand for real estate. So that's good. How are we doing on time, Marshall? We're good. Okay, so here's my conclusion on the U.S. economy. <coughs> consumer confidence, consumer spending's growing. That's contributing to growth. Market fundamentals, I don't see any near-term inflation worries. Interest rates are low. Corporate profits are healthy, that's good. It's all good, it's all blue sky. I don't see any problems right now. The, the only negative would be employment gains, which are improving, have been at a slower pace because of the uncertainty I mentioned earlier. I wanna examine briefly where the real estate is in the cycle. Generally speaking, it's, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth is not as heavily tied to the oil business as we were previously. That's more of a Houston type of economy, which we're in Houston, I don't remember the exact stats, but somewhere between 50 and 55% of all jobs in a big market like Houston are directly or indirectly related to the oil business, you know, which is plastics and you know, all petrochemicals. Uh, but Tex Dallas specifically is not as, as heavily tied to uh, the, the uh, profits or you know, the, the price of oil. I think generally speaking, lower energy costs are generally good for the economy, but not for all sectors of the economy. That's my opinion. I, once again, I'm just one guy up here talking. I don't, I, I'm not an expert in the energy business by any means. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to represent the real estate cycle as a sine wave, okay? Now, think of it going from left to right like a wave in the ocean and from peak to peak or trough to trough. These are, these are long wave cycles. These are eight to ten year cycles. So phase one, I'm going to call it recovery. That's the springtime. The market's coming back to life. Rents are increasing, so they're this side of the, ax of the vertical axis, but they're still below the long-term occupancy rates, which is the horizontal axis. All right, we eventually move into phase two. That's the summertime. It's the best time to be in the business. As you'll see, most of our markets are now in expansion. Uh, we're above our long-term occupancies. Rents are increasing. We always overdo it, especially in Dallas, but all markets overdo it at some point. We oversupply ourselves. We move into phase three, oversupply the autumn time. Finally, phase four, that's the recession. That's winter. The market's dead. Tough time to be in the business. All right, so so strategy-wise, you want to buy at or near the bottom when the market shows signs of life early spring. At some point in phase two, or the expansion phase, you can justify new construction. Economic rents are there. You want to always sell at the peak. Now our company, I don't take credit for this, but we sold, Doc, how many hotels? 40 hotels? August of 2007. So if you remember where we were in 2007, we were right there, and we sold hotels. So we got very fortunate to sell at the very top and we didn't ride that market down. As you know, hotels are the most volatile because of the short-term nature of their income. Um, so I'm gonna represent uh, US-wide where, where these sectors are. So office is a red. I'm gonna say office is probably late recovery across the board in US, entering, about to enter the expansion phase. Retail is in the early expansion phase in my estimation. Hotels a little further along in the expansion phase. You're starting to see some hotel construction now. Uh, industrial. A little further along, especially the warehouse distribution space, you're seeing quite a bit of new construction there. And then finally, multifamily. My good friend Brad Miller is here. Uh, Brad's, we're, we're doing a lot of construction right now. And I would say multifamily, Brad, I don't know if you agree, but multifamily is probably further along in the expansion phase. Yes. Mid, mid to maybe even approaching later expansion in some markets. Now this is broad, broadly speaking US. So take these one by one briefly. Office employment, as I mentioned, the drivers there, the sectors and it's in the early expansion phase. Now, this is a screen capture from Real Capital Analytics. So this shows the US vacancy rates going back to early 2000s in orange. You can see a cycle here, and Dallas-Fort Worth is blue. Now, I wanna point out, this is institutional office. Right? It's not office across the board. These are, that's what Real Capital measures is institutionally owned. Think of the larger, uh, better quality office buildings. And you can definitely see 
Vacancy rates trending downward, both nationwide and in Dallas. We've seen a lot of great absorption here in Dallas. These are sales volumes. So a huge, huge peak in sales, 07, 08, right before the crash. And they're, they're trending upward again, but not at the levels we saw previously. This is US wide. This is Dallas, very similar there, sales volumes. This is cap rates. Once again, institutional properties. Now there's a break in the line here because I guess there was not many sales in Dallas, the blue line. But the point is, I, I definitely see cap rate compression uh, around 7% uh, in most markets. So uh, I, in frank, frankly, you know, trying to buy office buildings, I think the capital markets have gotten a little ahead of the fundamentals. Uh, we've seen cap rate compression, but not the uh, corresponding increase in absorption. And things are getting bid up for sure. Uh, this is construction pipeline in office. It's, you know, it's, it's not that high, but it is expected to grow over the several, next several years. We do have a project under construction now. I'll, I'll mention briefly. This is industrial demand. I would say it's midway in the expansion phase. Industrial is the most highly correlated to our economy. So these are vacancy rates in the U.S. Orange, they've come down rapidly. Same with Dallas-Fort Worth, blue. These are sales volumes. They're almost where they were in the prior peak. This is Dallas-Fort Worth. They're pretty much at where they were in the prior peak. These are cap rates, both U.S., orange, and Dallas blue. Once again, you see a break. But uh, this is interesting. I, I, when I ran this chart, I wasn't expecting to see cap rates increase in Dallas for industrial. I'm not sure I know what to attribute that to. I would expect to continue to see a, a line like this, which is more uh, price decline, or I'm sorry, cap rate declines, price increases. This is a construction pipeline, nothing out of control now or forecasted for industrial. There's a lot of discipline in the market. All right, so working age adults live for employment related reasons where they live and they form households. And there's two key fundamentals going on right now in multifamily. Number one is home ownership rates. So this is the bubble again, US home ownership rates really kind of trend between 63 and 65%. During the housing bubble, Everybody wanted to own a home, they shot up to almost 70%. Now, percentage-wise, it doesn't seem that much, but that's 4.4 million households. So here to here is a difference of 4.4 million households that once owned are now renters again. So that's working in the favor of multifamily. So that's one of the big increases in demand. And the other, as Brad and I discuss often, is new household formations. Now, what I'm showing here is civilian labor force, young adults. So I'm saying 25 to 34 year old people with jobs are in the workforce. And if you've got a job, you're going to need a place to live. You move away from mom and dad. You've got your education. And, and young adults, millennials, are rising at the fastest rates since my generation, the baby boomers. And that has another. So we have demographics at work here, too. So we have demographics and a housing crisis have all uh, created the perfect storm for multifamily. And we've seen huge multifamily uh, vacancy rate declines and absorption. So these are apartment vacancy rates nationwide, which is orange, and Dallas, which is blue. Vacancy rates are, you know, approaching 5%. So they're approaching historic lows. Uh, we're seeing a lot of sales volumes. In fact, sales volumes are back to where they were in the prior peak. Dallas-Fort Worth over where they were. Lots of, lots of uh, transactions in multifamily. Cap rates. Now, I was also surprised to see this one. Multifamily cap rates nationwide are approaching 6%. Dallas has moved back up to 7 Now, I don't follow uh, specifically apartment sales in Dallas, but uh, I was surprised to see that moving back up. I'm not sure that's a trend or not. I don't see an oversupply brewing. I think there's a good balance in the market. Brad, you may disagree. I know some markets are probably oversupplying, but by and large, I think there's good discipline, don't you? There's good discipline. Right. In fact, the prediction is that apartment supply will peak in 2005. Now, this is nationwide. In 2015, I'm sorry. This is nationwide. And then start to taper off a bit. So I, I just don't see a big problem on the supply side on apartments. I don't. We'll look briefly at retail. These are retail sales. They're trending about, growing about 4% a year. You know, I, I, I crammed 20 pounds into a 10-pound bag. I apologize. I know we're running out of time here. I'll, I'll blow through these quickly. Uh, retail. Vacancy rates uh, are declining both nationwide and in Dallas. Sales volumes are increasing. We see a lot of similarities in these charts. This is Dallas. 
This is cap rates continuing to compress in retail. We've seen big, big cap rate compression there. Uh, construction pipeline increasing but not getting out of control. Uh, these are hotels. Now, now this is, uh, what this chart shows you is all 52 weeks of the year, peak hotel occupancies in the summer months. In red is where we are now. The worst year was 2009. So you can see that uh, hotels are finishing a t very strong 2014. Uh, we're, we're invested pretty heavily in hotels. Uh, we've had increases in occupancy nationwide, increases in RevPAR. So the hotel market is healthy. Sales volumes are not quite where they were previously. Market's taken a little longer to catch up there. Cap rates, not a lot of data here uh, in terms of sales, but generally a downward trend, as you can see. So here's my conclusion. Credit markets have recovered. Capital's available. Uh, underwriting standards are stringent, though. I mean, banks are... Uh, banks are uh, underwriting, I think, they're, they're doing a good job and they're just not flooding the market with dumb money. Vacancy rates, cap rate trends, as you've seen, are declining. All property sectors, sales volumes are recovering and have accelerated. New supply is increasing, but I think it's remaining disciplined. All, all indicators, by my view, are giving me a green light. Economy is doing really well. Um, I don't know if you would agree or not agree, but uh, I, based on the fundamentals I see here, I see increasing demand uh, across all real estate sectors for the foreseeable future, barring a shock, well, something we can't predict. A war in the Middle East uh, that shuts off oil supply, um, you know, ch uh, something going crazy in China, you know, some, some event that we can't predict causing, uh, causing things to uh, disrupt our economy. Right, but right now, I think it's blue sky. You guys agree, disagree? I'm, I'm generally an optimist anyway, but uh, I really don't see a problem. Uh, just a, few, uh, if, just a few representative transactions and I'm done. This is a uh, deal that uh, at One Dallas Center, formerly Patriot Tower, we were involved in. Uh, this was a uh, foreclosure uh, in the first uh, 90 days of putting it under contract, largely through Daryl and his team's help. Uh, we were able to pre-lease this building before we closed, before it closed, uh, almost 240,000 square feet, largely HKS Architects relocated, Greyhound renewed, so this is a very successful project that we uh, have maintained a carried interest in, uh, done very well. Uh, this is a project in Indianapolis we bought in January and sold in June. Was it June, Rodrigo? Uh, we bought it empty. Uh, we liked it because it was a great building, good floor plate. You know, Indianapolis is a little slower market, but we knew that we would probably uh, uh, get this thing leased. And within six months, we filled it back up to Lowe's Home Improvements. We've since sold it, made a substantial profit for our investors. Here, this building, two forests, we bought in, they start to run together, July? We closed in July. We bought this building, we love this building. We bought this building at 81% leased, and Daryl, we are, no, I'm sorry, excuse me, 71% leased. We are now 84, 85, going to 95, right? Exactly. These, these are my two leasing animals right here. These guys are going to fill it up. And by the way, if you need space, available, available right here. <laughs> She's the nice one, yeah. right? He's the, he's the, but he gets the work done too. So uh, I love these guys. They're great. Doing a good job. Um, Gearbox uh, is our anchor tenant in our newest development, which is up in Frisco. Uh, we're 55% pre-leased. We broke ground in July, August, August, and uh, we delivered next August. We're having tons of activity here. Um, very successful project. We're very excited about it. And uh, this is our newest acquisition last week. Uh, this is a building in suburban Denver we just bought. Uh, very similar to the one in Indianapolis. It's a large building, uh, big floor plans, lots of space. It's a single tenant deal. The tenant is Travelport, which is the travel uh, affiliate that, that started with United Airlines. They're going to vacate, actually, but we, we, we made a good buy here. We're going to backfill this building and make a lot of money on it, too. All right? Aren't we, Rodrigo? So that's it. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you.